Hi. Let me tell you a pointy story. That is a story with a point to it. Years ago, Rene McPherson, the former chairman of Dana Corporation, became the dean of the Stanford Graduate School of Business, my alma mater. It was a brief tenure, unfortunately, because he was hit by a car a few months after his nomination and passed away soon after. But he said a lot of wise things while he was dean. And the one that struck me the most was in response to a question by a student. Who was the smartest manager in your company? One student asked. McPherson said, it was not the CFO, nor any of my VPs, all of whom are very smart, certainly smarter than me. Rather, it was the machinist who walked the lathe on the shop floor. How come, asked the student. Because, said McPherson, that guy, in those years was only a guy, made 15 grand a year plus a bonus of three. This, of course, was many years ago. But on this salary, you raise the family, pay the mortgage, save for college for his kids, bought his wife a dress for Christmas, and put aside some money for a new fishing pole. That machinist, said McPherson, was the smartest manager in the company. So if I, the CEO, didn't ask him what he thought about my corporate plan, what was right about it, and what I should do differently, then both the company and I, the CEO, were missing a lot. This answer left a big impression on me. And ever since, I made a point to ask low and mid-level employees what they thought of a company strategy, what they do better, and why. Then I shut up and listened. And ever since, I'm constantly surprised at employees' insight, how much they do know, and what bright suggestions they have. This mindset, by the way, is often the opposite of most chartered financial analysts, CFAs, who see a company only via its accounting numbers. 99% of them won't give the machinist the time of day. So if you do, when you sleuth a company, you take the CFA's money. Now, why am I telling you this story? for three reasons, who do not seem related, but are. The first reason, about 20 years ago, I talked to a Canadian army officer who was helping train the Ukrainian army. The biggest issue, he said, was that the Ukrainian officers still thought like Russians. Before 1991, remember, Ukraine was part of, part of Russia. So the officer despised the lower ranks, harassed them and ignored their views. It was hard, said the Canadian officer trainer, to get Ukrainian officers to change their outlook. The soldiers were not dummies. They had both brains and initiative. So if officers just let soldiers say what they thought, yes, like McPherson's machinist, they might improve operations. And then soldiers would also fight better because they'd feel part of the unit and then all would win together. Now, why am I telling you this? In a video meant to help you take the money of those who don't watch these videos? I'm getting to it. Here's the second reason. In June this year, I noted that in investing, like in war, it's not just a game of numbers. And I gave you an imaginary scenario of two countries at war, thinly disguised. And indeed, perhaps because of a change of attitude of the Ukrainian army top brass, as well as modern training, Ukrainians today seem to be winning big and unexpectedly. On the other hand, Russian soldiers complain endlessly about their officers, their weapons, their food, and no one knows why he's there. Worse still, the Russian army seems incapable of running even the simplest combined operations. Air force and infantry and armor acting all together as one unit. All right, now, now for the third and final obvious reason, leadership, both in war and in commerce. I told you before, that historical analogies are useful to understand both of the above. The Russian dictator seemed similar to the old Persian king who invaded Greece just to suppress the uppity folks who refused to kowtow to him. He brought along hundreds of thousands of troops. On the other hand, the Ukrainian leader seems more akin to the Spartan commander who laconically said of the invaders, their king made a mistake by sending slaves to fight free men. This also seemed to be the case in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The complaining Russian soldiers, the corrupt officers, the kleptocrat general staff, all of Putin's sycophants are as close to slaves as can be. 
You think I'm exaggerating? Think again. A few years ago, I met some former Russian soldiers who emigrated to Israel, and we compared views about our respective military services. They told me about the infamous hazing rituals in the Russian army, the so-called Dovchina, which often maims and kills quite a few recruits. In no other army is there a parallel to it, not even the French Foreign Legion of old. Some remnants of the Dovchina in the new Ukrainian army led to its officers' old attitude to the soldiers, which the Canadian and other Western trainers tried to change. As a result of the change, there is no more such hazing. Today, Ukrainian soldiers feel part of their army and their units and their country. And unlike the Russian soldiers, they are certainly not slaves. Hence, the apparent big victory. I'm saying apparent because in war, as in the market, there are many twists and turns. And the Ukrainian lighting advance is causing panic, not just in Russia, but also in Europe, mainly in Germany and France. So it's still possible that the latter two countries will act behind the scenes to limit Ukrainian victories, because such a victory would go against their own long-term national interest. Why? Because then France and Germany will become second tier to Ukraine and Poland, which together would be a big military power that will switch American attention and money to the East. But that's another story. Now for the main point of this clip. This clip is meant to compare battles between free people and slaves in war and such battles in commerce. Both have similar results. When soldiers feel valued and are listened to, they fight well. The same goes for corporate employees like that old machinist in Dera Corporation or the Ukrainian soldiers. On the other hand, Russian soldiers, if they survive the hazing at all, are told to shut up and obey as unfortunately are many employees in modern corporations. How about the corporations in whose stocks you invest in your portfolio? Do you know which of these two extreme their employees fall into? Have you checked the Ukrainian free men and women on one side or the Russian slaves, the Dana model or the IBM of old? The question is, how can you find companies staffed by free to act employees who are encouraged to take initiative and are rewarded for it. One place where this is easily found is corporate spin-offs. Occasionally, a company spins off a division as a separate publicly traded stock with substantial shares going to management and often to employees who now can run their own show. In such spin-offs, managers and employees no longer have to obey blindly a distant headquarters diktat and can speak freely because they feel they own their joint which they indeed do. That's why spin-offs usually do very well. I mentioned two such Canadian spin-offs on January. Topaz, an oil company, TPZ, and Primaris, a real estate outfit, PMZ. The first is up 16% year-to-date, plus 5% dividend yield. The second is up 1%, plus 6% dividend yield. And that's the Canadian market as a whole is down 9% with only half the dividend yield of the spin-offs. Not bad, eh? And this in a terrible market environment too. As I said, feeling of ownership and motivation often makes the difference between victory and defeat. If you feel you have a share in the work or the battle and the benefits, then you exert yourself, both in war and in the market. Come to think of it. You can see Ukraine is just one more big spin-off with the same expected results. How can the above help you sleuth better in the future too? Before you invest, chat to the company's employees as much as you can. Ask them if their boss and listen to them. Then shut up and try to gauge how readily the employees apply themselves in their work. Like in work and in battle, investment too is about people. If employees feel valued, they will add value to your stock. If they don't, your stock will sink. It's a simple lesson. But if you know it, you will likely take the money of those who don't. That's all for today. Please let me know what you think of the above. Subscribe to the channel and tell all your friends who they subscribe to. Then buy my book, The Sleuth Investor, and tell about it too to your friends. I'll see you next time. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching.